Welcome back, everyone. I'm Jordan Giesegi, and this is The Limiting Factor. Tony Seba of Rethink X has projected that by 2030, it'll be possible to move the existing grid to 100% solar, wind, and batteries. And as a side benefit, that system would produce hundreds of terawatt hours of low-cost surplus power, or superpower. A number of people have asked me to give my thoughts on superpower, so today, that's exactly what I'm going to do. In short, my view is that although we are headed for a future that looks similar to what Tony's predicting, and that future is possible by 2030, I don't think it'll actually happen by 2030, and it may take another 10 years or so. Before we begin, a special thanks to my Patreon supporters, YouTube members, and Twitter subscribers, as well as Rebellionaire.com. They specialize in helping investors manage concentrated positions. Rebellionaire can help with covered calls, risk management, and creating a money master plan from your financial first principles. First, it's worth noting that I attempted to contact Rethink X and Tony Seba before releasing this video to make sure I represented their work accurately, but I was unsuccessful. That is, the information in this video is my best attempt at interpreting the documents and videos they've published for the general public. If I've made any errors, hopefully they'll respond in the comments or with their own video. To kick things off, what exactly does Rethink X mean by superpower? To understand that, let's start with some context. One of the primary arguments leveled against renewable energy generation like solar and wind is that because they're both intermittent, they can't fully replace non-renewable energy generation like gas and nuclear for when the wind isn't blowing and the sun isn't shining. While that's true, there are several potential solutions to the intermittency challenge. Let's look at just two. First, as Elon Musk presented in Tesla's Master Plan Part 3, it's possible to use a combination of technologies like electrochemical batteries, thermal batteries, and hydrogen storage to buffer the intermittent energy generation from solar and wind. I'd consider this the conventional and conservative way of thinking about the intermittency challenge, because it doesn't build in aggressive assumptions about how much cheaper battery technology will get in the next 10 to 20 years. The second potential solution to intermittency comes from Tony Seba's think tank, Rethink X. In 2020, they published a report titled Rethinking Energy 2020 to 2030, and the assumptions are more aggressive. The report points out that solar, wind, and battery prices are already so low that they're often the cheapest source of energy generation. But if we look at the trend of how they've reduced in cost over time and project forward based on Wright's Law, by 2030, each of those technologies will cost a fraction of what they do today. Next, using those cost assumptions, Rethink X modeled thousands of potential mixes of solar, wind, and batteries to find the lowest cost path to shift the current grid to 100% renewable energy. And the result is this U-curve. The X-axis shows how many times more generation capacity would be installed than in the average current electrical grid. And on the Y-axis is the cost of 100% solar, wind, and battery system. The area shaded in green shows the portion of the total system cost that's batteries, and the area shaded in blue is the portion of the total system cost that's solar and wind. Since batteries are more expensive, the most expensive system uses a huge amount of batteries and very little solar and wind. But if excess solar and wind generation is built, which has a much lower cost, then less battery capacity is required. The sweet spot for total system cost is where, depending on the region, there's about three to five times more generation capacity than the grid currently has, and is backed up by 35 to 90 hours of battery storage. That is, what Rethink X is saying here is that the cost of solar, wind, and batteries will get so low that they can be massively overbuilt to make up for the fact that they produce power intermittently. There are two implications to that. 
First, energy generation from technologies like nuclear and gas will not only no longer be needed, but will be completely pushed out of the market by the energy produced more cheaply by renewables. Second, the 100% solar, wind, and battery system is overbuilt so that it can cover the worst-case scenarios that only happen a few weeks or months out of the year. That means for most of the rest of the year, when there's an excess of wind and solar energy being provided at no marginal cost, thanks to the natural action of sunshine and wind, there would be an abundance of low-cost power, which Rethink X calls superpower. At a high level, superpower makes perfect sense. Technology advancements make things cheaper, and energy generation is no different. However, things get more complicated when we look into the details. To be clear, the points I'm about to make here aren't meant to devalue the work Rethink X did with this report. That's because the report was designed to paint a vision of what's possible as the cost of renewable energy generation plummets. It excels at that. That's as opposed to the purpose of this video, which is to look at the report through a more pragmatic lens. With that in mind, let's take a closer look at Rethink X's vision of superpower. The first thing that jumps out at me is that Rethink X calculated the ideal grid mix in terms of what it would cost to replace the entire electric power sector by 2030, as if it would be centrally planned. In reality, the grid in most countries is maintained by hundreds or even thousands of companies that each have their own profit motives. That means the grid emerges naturally over time as a result of free market forces and interventions by regulators and legislation. That has a number of implications. First, although the cost of new installations of solar and wind are now often cheaper than new installations of gas and nuclear power, the cost of continuing to operate existing gas and nuclear power plants is still competitive. That means existing generation facilities won't be replaced by solar and wind until the cost of new generation is significantly below the cost of continuing to operate gas and nuclear facilities. Furthermore, second, building new generation is capital-intensive and involves risk. That means it takes time to assess each new project over the course of its potential multi-decade life, and then build each project. Third, the fact that it's a competitive market means existing utility companies will attempt to slow down competition from cheaper renewable energy generation by influencing regulators, legislators, and transmission system operators. That could result in queues for new energy projects to connect to the grid, also called interconnect queues. That is, even if renewable energy generation has better economics, it's going to take time for generation capacity to be built, let alone to displace all other forms of energy generation by 2030. Next, beyond the market forces that'll make it difficult to rebuild the grid by 2030, there are also limits to how quickly solar, wind, and batteries can ramp. Let's use Rethink X's modeling data for Texas as an example. They show that just for the state of Texas, 2,325 gigawatt hours of battery capacity is needed by 2030 to switch to 100% solar, wind, and batteries. At a global level, this year, 167 gigawatt hours of battery storage is expected to be deployed, and the average growth rate over the past two years has been over 100%. However, that growth rate will moderate over time because the larger an industry becomes, the more difficult it is to continue scaling at 100% per year. With that in mind, let's say that the grid storage market continues to scale at 50% per year on average for the rest of the decade. At that growth rate in 2030, 1,900 gigawatt hours of grid storage would be deployed at a global level. That is, the amount of grid storage we can reasonably expect to be deployed for the entire world in 2030 isn't enough to cover what Rethink X is forecasting for Texas alone in 2030. The next thing worth noting about about the Rethink X report is that it was built around shifting the existing electrical grid to renewable energy rather than full decarbonization. 
As a result, the analysis becomes clumsy when it looks at how to decarbonize the transport, residential, commercial, and industrial sectors. For example, the 100% solar, wind, and battery system that they modeled for Texas for 2030 is enough to cover the current electric power sector and then has surplus superpower that could be used for the transport, residential, and commercial sectors. However, there's two issues with that. First, superpower will often be intermittent because it would be generated from solar and wind. As far as I can tell, that means people would have to shift their habits to take advantage of superpower, such as by charging their vehicle batteries at peak solar output in the afternoon. Even then, superpower wouldn't be reliable and would be catch as catch can. The second issue is that, as far as I can tell, when Rethink X refers to the transport, residential, commercial, and industrial sectors, they're strictly referring to energy from sources like gasoline and natural gas. That means in order to take advantage of superpower, by 2030, the entire vehicle fleet would have to be converted to EVs, and households would have to swap their gas water heaters and furnaces to electric water heaters and heat pumps. That's unlikely to happen in six years by 2030. Next, moving on to repowering the industrial sector with renewable energy by 2030, the analysis starts to fray further. Rethink X shows that by increasing the investment in a solar, wind, and battery system by 10% in 2030, it increases the amount of superpower by 310 terawatt hours. And then increasing the investment by another 10% only adds another 169 terawatt hours. That's because superpower operates on a U curve, which means there's diminishing returns for each dollar invested as total system cost goes exponential. That means in order to reach full decarbonization in Texas by 2030 with solar, wind, and batteries, it wouldn't take 10 or 20 percent more investment, but rather hundreds of percent more investment. Rethink X ignores the exponential cost dynamic and instead focuses on how much extra power 10 to 20 percent more investment provides. In my view, that was a missed opportunity to drive home the point about the power of decreasing technology costs over time. Why spend an extra 20% in 2030 to buy more superpower when you could, for example, just wait two to three years for the prices to drop by 20%? The result would still be the same amount of superpower, but for no additional cost. Or even better, it might be possible to show that if the cost reductions continued for another decade, for example, that full decarbonization would be possible in 2040 for the same cost as it would have to just replace the electrical grid in 2030. That is, why not just take Rethink X's point about the rapid and continuous reduction in the cost of solar, wind, and batteries to its ultimate conclusion, a fully decarbonized economy with low-cost power. Furthermore, by focusing on full decarbonization, other benefits emerge in the analysis. For example, an economy based on electricity is more efficient than an economy powered by fossil fuels. That reduces the total amount of energy required to fully decarbonize, making the overall task of full decarbonization less daunting. As a side note, pushing the analysis out for another 5 to 10 years would also make the report more realistic. That's because it would allow for more time to ramp the production of solar, wind, and battery production. As I said a moment ago, it's highly unlikely that there will be enough production in place to decarbonize the electrical grid within the next 6 years. But in 16 years, with compound growth, production capacity for renewable energy technologies will no longer be an issue. So why did the report by Rethink X focus on 2030 and 10-20% greater investment rather than, as I'm suggesting here, letting the cost reductions play out and focusing on a later date like 2040? My guess is that they considered it, but it wouldn't have blown people's minds as much or brought as much attention to their work. That's because converting just the electric power sector to renewable generation by 2030 has more immediacy and is more comprehensible than converting all generation and consumption for all sectors by 2040 or 2050. But, as I said, that's just my guess. Let me know what you think in the comments below. In summary, Rethink X paints an exciting vision for what's possible by 2030, and I expect in many ways they'll be proven correct. 
but in my view, possible is the operative word. Although the economics for superpower work out by 2030, globally, most grids aren't going to be rebuilt to the point where they can provide superpower for most of the year until more like 2040. That's because the cost of renewable energy generation has to drop significantly below the operational costs of existing generation. The time, money, and planning it takes to develop new grid projects? Existing utilities that'll attempt to slow down the competition from renewable energy and the simple fact that it'll take time to scale solar, wind, and batteries to deliver the amount of hardware that Rethink X is calling for. There will, of course, be some pockets of the world that shift their grid mix to solar, wind, and batteries much earlier than 2030, and as a result, see a surplus of low-cost power earlier, but it won't be the norm. Lastly, Rethink X's vision for the future stopped short of full decarbonization, which, in my view, is a missed opportunity. It leaves open questions, such as, are solar, wind, and batteries enough to transition the world to sustainable energy? And if not, what other technologies will be required? Or, what's the point of pursuing fusion power if it's likely that technology won't be cost-competitive with intermittent renewable energy? I'll be doing at least one more video in the Grid Storage series to explore those ideas. If you enjoyed this video, please consider supporting the channel by using the links in the description. Also, consider following me on X. I often use X as a testbed for sharing ideas, and X subscribers like my Patreon supporters generally get access to my videos a week early. On that note, a special thanks to my YouTube members, X subscribers, and all the other patrons listed in the credits. I appreciate all of your support, and thanks for tuning in.